Hi, everyone, and welcome to this third episode of our climate seminar series dedicated to climate change adaptation and mitigation. My name is Charmilino, and I'm project manager at Climact. I'm pleased to be the moderator of this session today. As you can see on the slide I'm sharing, uh, this is the program of today's session. First, Nicolas Agman is going to introduce uh, how, how um, he works on carbon capture and storage. Then we're going to have a brief discussion, brief Q&A with the participants. And Berta Moya is going to talk about biochar carbon removal, key insights into the most scalable and durable carbon removal solution available today. Once more, a brief Q&A. And we're going to end the session around a quarter past one. The presentations are going to be in English. But don't hesitate if you have questions to ask them in French. And uh, will, it will be a pleasure for me to translate them. Also, uh, as we go, don't hesitate to write your questions in the chat. And when we have the Q&As, open your mic, open your camera, don't be shy, uh, talk with us. And uh, don't hesitate also to raise your digital hand if you want. So I'm going to introduce briefly Nicolas. So Nicolas Hagman is a geoecologist working on biochar for more than 10 years. He studied and earned his PhD at the University of Tübingen on the interaction of biochar and nitrogen in soil and compost. Today, he is working on optimizing biochar production and application in agriculture. Also, he's working on other negative emission technologies such as enhanced weathering. I'm gonna stop sharing my slide and leave you the floor, Nicholas. Yes, thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction and the opportunity to, to be here and um, yeah introduce you a little bit to biochar and pyrogenic carbon capture and storage. So I put the subtitle here, um, negative emissions made by plants and fire. And so let's start with the fire because this is the interesting thing. How do we um, produce biochar? Everyone, everyone actually probably will have produced some biochar or charcoal in his life, you do it already when you just light a match. And so if you have a close look, what happens to this match that has just been uh, that has just been started? Um, everyone says, yeah, yeah, we see fire. But what is this exactly? What happens when you start the match? You create a heat impact to this little piece of wood. And so actually, uh, the wood wants to react. It wants to oxidize. But there is no oxygen. Why is there no oxygen? Of course, there's oxygen, but the oxygen is just on the surface of this of the wood. But the whole piece of wood is heated. And so, at least in the wood, there is no oxygen to react with. And so, a process called pyrolysis is, kicks off, is kicked off. And that is a thermal conversion in the absence of oxygen that con um, converts the biomass uh, molecules, so the, um, all the, the, the carbohydrates, the the lignin and whatever we have in there and transforms it into new compounds, which of which some remain solid, of which others are uh, are in the gas phase. And they will escape and then they will mix with the oxygen in the air and then they will burn. And this is the combustion, this is the flame that we actually see. The other process that we see here is a little bit of, of gasification. That means that the newly formed char that formed from this wood um, reacts with the with the oxygen and uh, and also with the water vapor and to which changes a little bit uh, the properties and creates some more gas that is also burned. If you have this happening in a large bonfire, you have so much mass of the biomass and the char that is formed that the heat in this mass is enough um, to then kick off the burning of the charcoal once the pyrolysis is done. When you do a bonfire, this is the moment where you start, uh, when you start the barbecue. You don't put the barbecue on the open fire, you start it when the char is, is burning. If you have this little, um, um, this little match, the, the mass is too small, it cools down too quickly, and thus, with that, usually uh, it doesn't burn to ash completely, but still you will have at least a little tip uh, of black char that, that remains. And this is how we go into um, pyrogenic carbon capture and storage. 
Actually, we rely on the plants who are doing the most important job to us, and that is the carbon removal from the atmosphere. They do photosynthesis and transform the CO2 into the biomass. Then we come with pyrolysis, and as you learn, it's the thermochemical conversion, the absence or more or less absence of oxygen. We produce the char, but we also produce stuff that is in the gas phase, of which some will, will be permanent gas, and then other molecules will be condensable and can form an oil once cooled down to ambient temperature. These are the, um, the three products. Of course, the, we, set, we focus our attention today on, on the biochar, what you can do to it. But first of all, you have these, uh, these other components that in most pyro commercial pyrolysis units are burned, just as we saw it in the match, they are burned without separation to generate energy. Still, um, you can uh, then you could use the CO2 um, to separate it and to store it. This is not done by any installation in the world that I'm aware of, simply to uh, limitations of the availability of sites to dump CO2 and also um, or some technical limits regarding the size of the pyrolysis unit and the necessary size of a uh, CO2 concentration unit must have. Um, the bio oil is usually also burned, but there's also uh, some people uh, like Charm Industrial who use it um, to do carbon sequestration as well by geological storage. Many people work on uh, transforming bio oil into into uh, into some materials of use, or at least into a storable uh, fuel that you can, for example, do pyrolysis all year round, but not burn the oil in summer, but save it for the winter when you need uh, more, more energy, for example, in your district heating grid. Now, most interesting, uh, the biochar, which is uh, so far for, in most projects, the single source of the, of the negative emission by a non-oxidative use. So, of course, if you put in wood into this process, you could, can also consider this just as a charcoal and use it as a fuel. But of course, then we don't get our negative emissions. We want to use our bio, uh, the biochar as a, as a product, not as a fuel. So we use it in, in agriculture, in, uh, we use, put it in the soil, and it shows some pictures on this, or you use it in animal farming. A new trade is to, to uh, um, new trend is to use it also in, in materials. Uh, which has some very interesting applications. Um, but yeah, first of all, the most obvious question, why are we looking at this stuff? Why did people ever consider to, to turn this into a kind of a climate tech? Um, so first of all, um, the biochar is it's the oldest chemical of, of humanity. And my favorite example for this is Ötzi or the, the ice, the Tyrolean ice man. Um, he was carrying a bucket of, of charcoal, mainly because he needed it as a, as a, as a fuel, and he could use it to transfer, to transport, um, his energy. It's a kind of a, um, um, I say, yeah, a kind of a movable battery to, to some extent. And he had a, he had like 50 tattoos and, um, the colorant that was available to use to make these tattoos for medical purposes was charcoal as well. Also, um, the pyrogenic carbon, so this is now the, the chemical term of describing what, what this is based on its uh, chemical nature. Pyrogenic carbon is part of the natural soil organic matter. Um, a relevant part of soil organic carbon is pyrogenic due to, mainly due to uh, wild, natural wildfires that occur now and in the past. Also, biochar is in the end traditionally used in agriculture all around the world and probably for a very, very long time. My favorite example for this is a textbook from the USA from 1847, a brief content of American agriculture and in there several chapters deal with the agronomic use of biochar. But the most well-known examples are the anthropogenic dark earths um, especially the so-called terra preta do indio, so the black earth of the indigenous people of the Amazon basin. And what you see here to the right is just a, is a soil profile of a, what you expect as a soil scientist when you travel 
to the tropics and you're maybe not in a super volcanic area, but you're an area where the soil is very old. You never had an ice age that put the reset button on soil formation. So this soil can be several hundreds of years old. And to the left, you see it's uh, anthropogenic counterparts or soil that received inputs from agriculture, maybe from over decades or centuries, and it turned black and contains a lot of organic matter. It's much more fertile than, um, than its natural counterpart. And this is when, what you can only explain uh, with anthropogenic inputs, and that is uh, and that is charcoal. But not only charcoal, but it also contains traces of other inputs, especially also of feces. So you need, it's not just about, also here we learn, it's not just about putting the char into the soil, but it's char with other things that in combination make the soil more healthy. And the very interesting part is that for a decade, people have been focusing just on the terra preta in, in the Amazon region. But in fact, we find similar situations in also in the subtropics, like in Australia, but even in the temperate zone, like here, the Nordic terra preta in the German, in north of Germany. And so why is it so cool that even people hundreds of years uh, used this, um, this black uh, material? So what you see here is an electron micrograph of a piece of charred uh, beech wood. And so you see, um, no matter what happens on the chemical level, physically, it's unchanged. It's a bit smaller, but the structure of the plant is still there. And this is quite fascinating. So you see there um, really um, the structure that, of the wood that helps it to transport water up, uh, up into its canopy. And so this makes it very porous and it gives it a large surface area. But this is not uh, the whole story. The other thing is what happened on the chemical level. We transform all these uh, different uh, biomolecules that uh, form biomass, or in this case, wood. And um, we form aromatic uh, carbons. And so what you see here is another electron micrograph, but several orders of magnitude with high resolution and much more science that you have to put on the on the chart before you can make such a picture. And what you see here is the atomic structure of many carbon atoms. So each black dot, dot here is a carbon atom that form this large, um, this large layers of, uh, of what we call aromatic clusters, which give, which are very unique um, to pyrogenic carbon and which gives them very, very interesting uh, properties. And so how um, how does that all work? I already mentioned the large surface area, aromatic carbon, plus the mineral substances that we have there. So the ash that comes with the biomass. So we have a material with low bulk density that may help the soil to store water and to bind nutrients and also to um, better bind and remain uh, and retain organic substances in the soil mainly due to the ash, but also due to the carbon. Uh, we have changes in the pH and, uh, and changes in, in the redox state of, um, of the soil. And some biochars, like when you produce a biochar, for example, from sewage sludge or from manures, may also release nutrients. But for most of the biochars on the market, this doesn't play um, a role. And a key thing is um, it supports microorganisms in their digestion. Because you've seen the structure with a lot of um, carbon uh, carbon atoms all connected, and these uh, structures are conductive and may help to store and uh, to transfer electrons. And now you say, what does it, this have to do with microorganisms? Everything. Life is all about transferring electrons. What you do when you eat, you eat a bread, and this is basically eating high energy electrons. And when you breathe, you exhale. A water vapor and the water vapor is nothing but low energy electrons and the same and this is the same what microbes do but for them as they cannot eat something but have to do everything externally think is much more difficult biochar helps to improve this and this helps to improve uh, organic carbon nutrient cycling in soil um, looking at the time i will uh, skip this or keep this short there's been thousands of uh, investigations on biochar, especially on the effect on, on agronomy. And to keep it short, no matter which question you ask, biochar um, usually makes it somehow better or does not have, at least not have a negative impact. 
So how to use it um, in agriculture? These are just some pictures from our uh, from our research. Biochar is very expensive at the moment. In Switzerland, it's easy to pay thousand bucks or even fifteen hundred bucks uh, per metric ton for it. So you have to use it in a way that the plant really directly benefits from it. And that's why we do a lot of research on how to apply small amounts of biochar, that is like one ton or even less, right in the root zone of the of the plants. Or we combine it with other practices of carbon farming, like the winter greening, um, and use the biochar to help the soil then kind of digest uh, the remainings of this, this winter greening. Or we suspend biochar to make it um, as a concentrate fertilizers, combined with a fertilizer solution in, in irrigation. But the most widespread application, especially in, in Switzerland, where many farms are still uh, like very uh, complex and have uh, arable farming, they have vegetables, they have animals. There, um, the main application of biochar is what we call the cascading use of biochar. That means you start it, you use it as a feed additive, or you use it additionally in the stable to manage the odors and nutrient losses there. And then via composting or via the manure directly, it ends up into the soil. And does a second job after improving the health of the, of the of the animals. It does a second job or a third job in the soil by improving. And this cascading use is also very uh, very clever from the point of view that that fresh biochar actually agronomically is not so interesting. The older the biochar gets, the more interesting um, it is. So this is why still composting of biochar is one of the best pretreatments of for agricultural use. And this is um, a picture of my PhD. I spent quite a lot of time trying to understand. Agriculture is cool, but also, as I said, it's super expensive. And so, uh, at least, especially when you need certain, certain quality criteria that you have to fulfill in agriculture. So we're looking for other stuff where you can uh, either use um, biochar with a wider range of specifications or where you need less biochar to easier get value for, uh, for your money. And in materials, this is about um, is about concrete production. Um, there it is. There are different um, options how to to look at this. Uh, the thing, the one, the one that I find best is just to try to enable the use of lower grade sand because, um, in concrete production. Because usually people say, "Yeah, sand is sand," but once you get really into the details of engineering, you learn sand is not equal. It's not it is not always the same kind of material and not all sand is suitable for concrete production and adding biochar can help um to to use more uh also lower grades and than before there's some interesting work going on on using biochar in asphalt um both for making new roads as well as um, maintaining um, old roads um, and can improve the properties and endurance of the asphalt and one thing that I like uh, very much is the use of, of biochar, for example, here in, in snowboards. And this is very interesting because it's not just you need not just need a, a filler for your, the plastics that you uh, that you use um, in the snowboard. But this is also about the electrostatics, because if you're really doing um, professional this professionally and you want to really get the best board in the world, one thing is you make sure is that you don't get um, that you're not uh, slowed down by electrostatics in your um, snowboard and the electric properties of biochar here help to deal with them. Industrial um, production of, um, of biochar, I just have here a collection of some various pictures. The key message here is there's a dozens of ways of how to produce biochar and it depends on um, the scale that you want to operate at, the type of biomass that you want to put in, um, and also the type of biochar that you want um, to get out. And so from the perspective of the negative emission technology, this is uh, yeah super fascinating because it's like not, not this one or these three startups doing that one technology. It is uh, 20 plus uh, companies across Europe and beyond who can deliver uh, units uh, that can can do the job just here are some uh, examples from, uh, from one from germany and two from uh, switzerland because um, again 
throughout this uh, talk, I ma was mainly talking about uh, biochar from wood. But actually, the most interesting part is when you're not using wood. For example, the German company Haberkabel, they're using uh, whatever is left over from the extraction of herbs for medical purpose or for, or for food purpose. Um, there's, um, there is Barry, there's Barry Calbo, um, who is doing, um, uh, uh, who's doing chocolate production and what is ever is left over from the cocoa that not goes into chocolate or into other sweet products is charred in their facilities. Or, um, with, uh, Philip Morris who have their tab tobacco leftovers and some paper that they cannot recycle and they turn this, um, into biochar. Of course, the latter is not suitable for agriculture because of the, all the colorants and plastics on the paper. So that goes into other. And so you really, uh, biochar production can be a chance to valorize low grade biomass, like especially what you see here down to the right. Um, this is a lot of stuff that contains um, plastic that you don't want just to compost and recycle it directly to agriculture. Pyrolysis helps to kill these plastics. When you not have access to such very nice and, uh, and very nice uh, pyrolysis units, and also you don't have, you can't get the money from valorizing the heat, then your option to go is low tech or actually no tech biochar production using uh, the so called Contiki method, where you basically just dig a hole and you have to obey to some rules, and then you can produce very nice and clean biochar. Nice and clean means um, biochar can also, some things also can go wrong with biochar production if you're not doing it right. That's why standards and certification of biochar are very important. Um, there in Austria, there is a ÖNORM, so something like an Austrian ISO norm on biochar and quality assurance there. Um, then in Switzerland, there is, when you want to use biochar in agriculture, it's mandatory that the biochar uh, carries the European biochar certificate, which was developed by Itaca Institute. And this is, and the main purpose of this is to make sure that biochar production is done properly and biochar is safe um, to use. When you have the product certification, then it's, you want also want to, uh, people want to include a certification of the climate impact of biochar. And um, I will only uh, introduce that very briefly. Here, um, the idea is that most of the biochar, and there's a huge discussion on how much uh, that actually is, is very stable and will not be oxidized by soil microorganisms over hundreds to thousands of years. But a certain share, of course, of this material is accessible to microbes or also to chemical processes in the soil and, and, will, be, and will be oxidized. But our understanding of this is improving. And so with that, we can base the biochar, the C-Sync, uh, so the negative emission certification um, of biochar on, on very simple principles. And that is we, we have to check a sustainable sourcing of biomass. Don't cut down forests to make biochar. This doesn't make sense. You have to um, make sure that the biochar is pro pro produced in a clean way and that all emissions are accounted for and that they are offset. Then it is as simple as tracking the biochar from a pyrolysis unit to the farmer or whoever uses it, who has to confirm um, its application in a matrix that does not allow it to burn it anymore. And then you can kind of start, start the clock and account for the biochar decay and have a very nice way of certifying or making sure that this carbon is stored. And with that, I'd like to close this talk and I'm happy to receive your questions. Now I will introduce our second speaker, Berta Moya. Berta uh, is a biochemical and environmental engineer with a PhD in soil sciences and circular economy. She's passionate about climate change mitigation and creating value for waste, which led her to the biochar sector around five years ago. At Carbon Capture, where she works, she helps carbon removal project developers navigate certification processes, and access the voluntary carbon market. Berta, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction uh, and thanks for the invitation. Um, let me uh, attempt to share my screen and I will start my presentation. Yeah, welcome everyone uh, and thanks for uh, for having us here. I will um, 
uh, I will take a, a bit of a, a step back and I guess put a bit of, of context uh, around biochar and its meaning or its significance uh, in, uh, in carbon removal. Um, as um, as Shamili mentioned, um, I work with the Carbon Future, um, where we work specifically on uh, carbon removal uh, projects, providing both um, trust infrastructure, so like the MRV that is needed uh, to deliver trustworthy carbon removal credits, and then we also have a, a marketplace where these credits can be can be sold. Um, so as I mentioned today, I want to focus on uh, key insights into biochar carbon removal and why it is the most uh, scalable and uh, currently most available durable carbon removal solution that we have. Um, first to take, as I, said, as I mentioned, a step back um, and think of, you know, why do we need uh, carbon carbon removal? Um, so this is a, a graph from the uh, IPCC that shows like the the path the what is needed for us to uh, actually achieve um net zero by by 2050 and remain um within the the global target that we have of um, 1.5 degree warming limiting 1.5 to limiting warming to 1.5 degrees um so first and foremost of course we need uh to reduce emissions uh, and avoid emissions as much as possible uh, but even when we will reach that point there, there will be some emissions, some fossil emissions um, that are unavoidable and that still need to be removed. And for those, we will need durable uh, carbon removal. And so this is why um, carbon dioxide removal, or CDR market, um, comes into play. Um, and the reason um, why we need to focus on this today, um, the current um volume of carbon removal that we have uh, is tiny compared to what we actually need. Um, so it was reported in 2022 that we currently um, remove two gigatons of carbon from the atmosphere, which is only 5% of the current emissions, uh, CO2 global emissions. Um, but what's important to note is out of these two gigatons, only 0.1% of those uh, are durable removals. And maybe to specify what I mean by durable removals, um, durable removal, which sometimes is also this called as permanent removals, um, it is carbon removal that actually removes CO2 from the atmosphere for the long term. So removes it from the natural biological cycles, moving it more into the longer uh, cycling terms of, of carbon, which would take thousands or tens of thousands of years. Um, so we really need to scale this new industry by uh, yeah, 5,000 times uh, to be able to reach the net zero targets. Um, and we need to start this today, even though the, the targets are in 2050, these, most of these approaches are quite new. And so we need, really need to develop them and scale them um, today. Another slide to set again, a bit of background on what I mean by reduction, removal, avoidance. Um, there are three quite different things. So reduction, I think is quite clear. So it's uh, reducing the amount of emissions um, that, that our daily activities or industries um, generate. Um, so these are measures that reduce the source of greenhouse gas emissions um, and um, yeah, and this is clear that it is needed, like is the first and foremost step um, to actually tackle the, the climate crisis. Um, then when it comes to, I guess, avoidance and removal, this is more in the context uh, of carbon credits and sometimes they get confused. Um, so CO2 avoidance um, is um, if I'm a company that is emitting one ton of CO2, I can pay someone else not to emit a ton of, a ton of CO2 through um, a specific project. Uh, so helping that project not emitting a ton of CO2, but at the end of the day, the balance is still one, one ton of CO2 emitted. With carbon removal, uh, these approaches are different in that uh, an industry can emit a ton of CO2, but then they would compensate those emissions with removals. Um, so actually actively removing CO2 from the atmosphere, so removing a ton of CO2 if it's one ton emitted. And so the balance there is net zero. 
So here we're talking specifically about um, CO2 removal. And for removals, there are several approaches that are uh, that are possible. Um, here's an, an example of them. So the ones in gray um, are more nature-based solutions that we talk about. Um, and these do remove CO2 from the atmosphere. But as I mentioned before, they, that CO2 is still um, in the shorter cycle, biological carbon cycle. So it, it will become available again uh, in decades into the into the atmosphere. Um, these are approaches that obviously are very much needed and we also need to focus on them, but then maybe not the best suited for uh, compensating for fossil emissions, uh, which are taking CO2 from uh, geological storages and putting them in, in the atmosphere. So the section on durable carbon removal that you can see here, um, these are the type of approaches that are available for um, durable carbon removal. So this is um, biochar, there's also carbonated building materials, um, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, direct air capture uh, with carbon and storage, um, which is quite popular in, in Switzerland, thanks to Climeworks, uh, also enhanced rock weathering uh, or several uh, ocean carbon capture approaches. Out of all of these, um, there are different stages of, of development, different scalability potential, different challenges that come into play when we think about how to scale them and the safety of deploying them at, at large scale. Um, but currently to date, biochar carbon removal is the only durable approach that is um, available uh, today and that we can focus on and scale on. Um, if we look at, um, there's this website that is quite nice, uh, it's called cdr.fyi, that actually looks at the this emerging uh, carbon dioxide removal market, which is pretty new, I would say it started maybe in, in 2020. Um, so it's a, it's a fairly, fairly nascent market. Um, and this is a report from 2022. And um, as you can see, um, the purchases that were done uh, in 2022 are yeah, really tiny compared to what is actually needed, what we will need by the end of the century. So we really need to start developing these all these approaches to date. Um, but if we compare the types of purchases that were made, um, I don't know if you can see clearly, but maybe biochar purchases were around uh, 40% and the other approaches um, direct air capture or mineralization were around 20 or 30%. But in terms of actual delivery, so these are the purchases that were made. Um, so this would be a lot of pre-purchases or commitments to purchase that were made. Uh, but the actual deliveries of carbon removal credits uh, in 2022, biochar um, is around 90% of the credits that can actually be delivered to date. Um, I'm talking a lot about credits and markets and these things. So this is another slide to set a bit of background again. Um, so I mentioned we need to reduce emissions and then compensate the residual emissions that are uh, that will still be there. And there's several types of instruments that are available to incentivize uh, these emission avoidance or carbon dioxide removal as well. We have policy measures um that are either um yeah demand and control instruments so this would be at the at the national level or the international level um documents that set out the legally binding reduction goals so we all know that the paris agreement all of those and these lead to compliance markets or compliance carbon markets um which are market instruments again at the national or international level um that set out different types of, of markets, uh, carbon markets and uh, exchange mechanisms between countries um, that are quite complex generally, but this is like the, the compliance market uh, for, for carbon credits. But currently uh, for carbon removal credits, um, there is only, I mean, yeah, besides this is also the, the voluntary market, um, which 
these are voluntary reduction goals that individual companies um, set. So these would be more, the compliance market is at the national level. The compliance market is more at the company level. Um, companies that purchase and retire carbon credits for their own claims and uh, emission targets. And um, back when the Kyoto Protocol existed, the voluntary market also, um, I think mainly started in, in the US who did not sign um, the protocol, but companies still wanted to, to participate. So then this market was created. Um, but currently for carbon removal, the compliance market is not uh, it's not ready yet. So there's different policies are being, um, being discussed and, and developed, but currently uh, when I'm talking about carbon removal credits, this is all in the, in the voluntary market. Um, and yeah, in the EU, for instance, they're developing the uh, carbon removal certification framework, uh, which is unclear. It would be at EU level, but it probably would be still voluntary market. But let's see. Um, so yeah, so the key message here is like to date, uh, carbon removal credits are uh, in the voluntary market. This doesn't necessarily mean that everything goes in the voluntary market. There's also, um, you know, companies um, that and groups that get together and define what, uh, you know, minimum rules uh, and what is best practices in the voluntary market. So this is just to highlight uh, a couple of different initiatives that exist um, and standards for carbon footprinting uh, or achieving net zero targets. Uh, so the science based targets initiative, for instance, um, sets out clear guidelines for companies on how to how to reach um, net zero and what they need to show to to do this and carbon removal credits uh, are always part of this and uh, the key thing in the voluntary market since it's not um, regulated as such there's a lot of reliance on on trust um, so what's what constitutes a, a trustworthy credit um, of course, it needs to be backed by robust science. Um, in carbon removal, this is really key because, as I mentioned, some of the technologies are um, emerging and the science is still evolving. So we need to be, make sure that it's backed by robust science. In the case of biochar, um, the science is there. As Nicolas um, explained, there's plenty of evidence of the and, and characterization of, of biochar and, and its effects. Um, a credit needs to be additional, meaning that the activity that is being purchased or like the, it wouldn't have happened, the credit, the activity wouldn't have happened uh, without the carbon removal credit that makes it additional. Um, obviously, the activity needs to be independently quantified and certified, um, also independently verified. This is a nuance, but like the the project needs to be certified by a party and then the activity needs to be verified by someone else. Um, and then transparency is is really key. And I will go into this um, more, but having clear tracking and traceability of um, of a credit is, is really essential. Um, also taking into account that in, in the past, um, there have been um, yeah, several cases where things were not done properly. So trust in the market has an, eroded a bit and so it's really uh, important to from the get-go um, having this transparency and, and traceability. Um, this is a, a graph that maybe seems confusing, I hope it's not too confusing, but this just highlights the fact that there needs to be independent parties uh, from that, that link uh, suppliers, so this is project developers, so in the case of biochar this would be um, biochar producers, they need to go through different steps that involve independent parties to then be able to generate credits and find buyers for those credits, um, which for many biochar projects are really essential because that, as Nicolas mentioned, um, the financial viability of uh, biochar projects depends on, on many different factors um, and the, the credits are increasingly play a, play a large role here. Um, the key message, as I mentioned from this, this uh, slide, would be that there needs to be an independent uh, standard setting body. This is the body that uh, will write a methodology uh, and hosts a registry. So they say in the methodology how the carbon accounting needs to, needs to happen for a specific project. Um, and then once 
a credit, uh, once a project is certified, they can start uh, generating credits, which are validated and verified by independent bodies. So here VVB is a validation and verification body. And once a credit will be generated, it will be under the registry of the standard. Um, and then the at that point, the, the credit can be um, can be sold. And what is really essential along this chain is to really have the, the tracking uh, all along the way uh, so that the different parties involved uh, are clearly identified and all the, the data from a project uh, is clearly, um, again, independently and transparently recorded um, by an, an independent body, which is something that um, Carbon Future offers. Um, going more into biochar uh, more specifically, um, I mean, Nicolas explained this um, in detail already, um, but just um, yeah, to, to highlight the different um, stages of, um, of a biochar project and the thinking more of like the, the tracking that might be needed um, along the way. Um, there is a feedstock, the pyrolysis plant, that generates biochar and then, but then the, the generation of the biochar itself is not enough to generate a carbon removal credit because the biochar carbon removal only really happens once the biochar is mixed into a stable matrix, meaning that that biochar will not be able to be combusted again um, because technically raw biochar is still um, flammable. So it's the, the step, here number four of carbon storage um, is really essential to to track and, and know exactly where the biochar um, has ended up and whether it is in um, again like Nicolas mentioned uh, with biochar it can be used in in agriculture um, there's many different ways of using it in agriculture but it can also be used in in construction materials concrete or asphalt um, and so it's really important to really um, know where this biochar has has ended up, where it has uh, traveled to account for those emissions. Um, and this is something that is um, taken care of in the, you know, knowing how to measure these things uh, in the different methodologies. So currently in the in the voluntary carbon market, um, there are, there are uh, five different standards that have biochar methodologies. Um, yeah, here you can see that the, they're from different countries um, and yeah, they have different dates of, of publication. Um, but the key thing uh, that we focus on uh, at Carbon Future is this, um, the, the tracking of the, of the biochar, as I mentioned. So knowing when it's produced, where it goes, and so that at the end uh, we can have a full um, transparency and I have all the carbon removal value chained um, captured uh, so that the um, and I will I will be very brief now because I'm seeing time um, so that then uh, at carbon future with this uh, MRV and marketplace uh, we make the link uh, between the the suppliers the standards the verification bodies um, so that a trustworthy carbon removal credit can be generated and then can also be sold um, on the uh, on the marketplace for companies that want to um, to compensate uh, their um, their emissions thank you <laughs>